So welcome everyone. This is uh, the third open education cafe that we organize uh, as uh, Spark Europe. And um, uh, I'm happy that we have uh, our open education champions with us today. My name is Paola Corti and I am the open education community manager for Spark Europe. And I have the privilege to work with the members of the European Network of Open Education Librarians. I am pleased, very pleased to welcome our Open Education Champions today who joined us to have a coffee. And uh, I have mine here. Um, if you don't have one yet, go and grab it. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss together action area two of the UNESCO year recommendation which focuses on developing supportive policy for open education. So this series, if you are familiar with it, dives into the UNESCO year recommendation with the aim to uh, share experiences and to make it even less theoretical and even more practical. Um, so I'm happy that uh, we have our champions here and uh, um, thinking, let me start with a, a very quick presentation of who is, who is in the room, and then I will leave you the floor so that you can share more. I will start from uh, who's first in my screen, and I have Katrin, Katrin Tronin from Ireland. Katrin is uh, an uh, open education uh, scholar and a researcher, and uh, she formerly worked for the National Forum in Ireland, and uh, she is a very uh, specifically expert in open education practices and I've uh, been learning from her largely lately. Um, and then we have uh, Mark, Mark van Oostendorp from Radboud University. And uh, please correct me if my pronunciation is not uh, <laughs> good enough. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, Mark is a professor of Dutch and academic communication at Radboud in the Netherlands. And then we have Antonio Martinez Arboleda, who is an academic lead of open education practices and co-director of the Center for Research in Digital Education at the University of Leeds in the UK. And finally, last but not least at all, Melissa Hayton, uh, who is the director of learning, teaching and web services and uh, assistant principal for online and open learning at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Welcome all of you. I'm very happy to have you in the room and uh, to have this discussion ongoing and to bring open education policies into under the spotlight together. So what is the, um, the second action area about in the UNESCO year recommendation? Um, we have uh, many, keywords in there. Uh, we have developing and implementing policies and or regulatory frameworks. We have encouraging and supporting institutions to develop or update legal or policy frameworks. We have mechanisms, develop mechanisms to create communities of practice, but also to uh, include OER and uh, the power of OER in uh, transforming education. Uh, I would love to for you to start uh, telling us about you, the project that you are doing now, about that, and how you are supporting the transforming this from theory to practice in your context and uh, in the wider um, scenario. So, Katrin, you are the first in my screen. I would love you to go first. So uh, you just want a short introduction to begin with, Paula? Yes, please. Yes, of course. Um, delighted to be here. And I, I see both on the panel and also in the guests, some people who I continue to learn so much from about open education practices and policies. So um, really thrilled to be here. And thanks for the invitation. Um, as Paula said, I have worked for many years in, in Irish higher education and most recently with the National Forum for the Enhancement of Digital Teaching and Learning um, in Ireland. Um, I was the digital and open education lead there, but since the start of this calendar year, the start of 2022, I've been an independent scholar um, and my work is 
largely focusing on critical and social justice approaches to digital and open education. So I've been doing a number of things, but probably the two main pieces of my work have been uh, a GoGN fellowship this year. Um, and for that work, I've been collaborating with various community-based organizations um, and initiatives here in the Galway area, uh, the, the region where I live, um, collaborating with them to facilitate the sharing of community-focused knowledge um, openly. And secondly, um, I am working on a book project with um, Laura Chernewich at the University of Cape Town. We're co-editing a volume called Higher Education for Good Teaching and Learning Futures. And we are we invited all of the contributors. We have a, a wealth of global contributors to really imagine alternative futures for higher education in this moment um, of crisis in which we're living. Um, and those futures that foreground inclusion, social justice, care, uh, and sustainability. So we're very excited about that. It's due for publication in 2023. And um, the, the, the contributions, because it's an edited collection, it's not a journal, The we were able to ta take a lot of freedom in terms of the genres represented. So we have academic articles, poetry, a graphic novel, speculative futures, haiku, artwork. Um, so we're really excited about that. And um, that's taking a lot of my, my effort at the moment. So I'll stop there maybe and uh, and so you can go to the others on the panel. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. As usual, you have a lot to a lot to share and we are all learning from you. So thank you. Mark, you are next on my screen. Would you like to tell us more about what you're doing now? And uh, most of all, if it is related with the open education policy making. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, um, I suppose because so in your first introduction you also asked us to to uh, to say, to say something about how we move from theory to practice, but I suppose I'm I'm very much into grassroots open education work. So I'm basically a teacher, and as a teacher I got interested in putting my own uh, material online uh, and making it open and openly available to everybody and then helping other people do that as well. So that's mostly what I do. I'm at heart, a teacher, I believe in education, uh, and I believe in education for as many people as possible. I'm at, so I work here at Radboud university in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a, I'm a linguist. Uh, I teach um, I teach linguistics, and I'm very enthusiastic about uh, about linguistics. So I want everybody to uh, to know about it. I think it's very important that everybody knows about it. I hope uh, we will do a cafe one day about linguistics too. Uh, uh, but I, so this is what I do. I I I make my own material open as much as I can. And then I'm also uh, practically involved in trying to convince my colleagues in doing that and helping them practically to do that. Now as to policy, so that means I'm, uh, so I'm not, I'm not directly involved myself in policy, except that I, you know, I have a relation to the, to the policy makers who are, who are above me. I suppose that's, that's my role here. That uh, at least I, I see my role here as somebody who is doing grassroots work and uh, sees policy from that from that perspective uh, uh, as well. Thank you, Mark. And this perspective, we all, always have to keep that in mind. So I'm very grateful for you to be here and share with us exactly from the perspective of the teachers. And right. why not? We might want to organize a, a webinar also <laughs> on an angle that relates to linguistics in the future. Why not? Sure. <laughs> Antonio, you are next on my screen. Hello. Ciao. Ciao. Hola. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you. Um, I know uh, the work of many people here, both taking part into the cafe and also in the audience. I've seen a few names. Hello, everybody. And uh, yeah, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, my involvement with policy, my work, um, I started with open education resources also as a teacher who was uh, creating OER with, uh, with his students. 
uh, I've been running a module on uh, podcasting, uh, research-based podcasting uh, that started in 2012, and it grew as a as a as a course because originally it was just for students of Spanish, uh, but then it became uh, a final year project available to students of all the languages that we have in my school. Um, so promoting the creation of open education resources, actually getting students to create them in the way of podcasting. Um, I also was involved in the writing of our OER policy uh, here at the University of Leeds in 2013. I was one of the people who was in the committee writing up um, the policy, which was later uh, revamped in 2017. Uh, more recently, I've been involved in the development of a podcasting initiative for the University of Leeds. And in my role as uh, academic lead of open educational practice, I'm doing other things like uh, developing, um, supporting the creation of a new uh, networked referatory or repository uh, for our institution and other things that we can talk about later about but my, my my relationship with policies is uh, I, I remember Paul uh, Paul asked about whether it was a, a relationship of love or hate um I don't really love or hate policy but I have to say that uh, policy needs to move on um because uh, we've been writing policy for colleagues who want to engage with OER and we need to start considering policies um, for a scenario in which we have actual expectations within institutions mm, of um, developing, uh, promoting, uh, mainstreaming OER. Um, and one thing that I wanted to say for everybody in the audience, uh, when I was preparing for this talk, I'm going to share a little bit of an insider tip I, I thought, oh, I need to read more about OER policy, even though I think I know about it. And I, I went to Wikipedia and the page on Wikipedia on open educational resources policy is amazing, truly amazing. And there are some documents there that perhaps we can mention later. Yeah, I, re I truly recommend that web page. I don't know, that Wikipedia page. I'm sure some of you there in the audience may have had something to do with that Wikipedia page. Thank you. Melissa, and thank you, Antonio. And you also started uh, sharing with us about your love and hate. So I'm very happy to, to listen to Melissa now and then maybe go back to the rest of our guests to know about their relationship in practice with open education policies. Melissa, please. Thank you very much. I think we have a good relationship with the policy at University of Edinburgh. It's been in place for a while and we've reviewed it recently and it's still strong. It's still good. Um, Lorna Campbell is in the room. I heard a lot of her work um, at University of Edinburgh is, is the actual delivery of um, the support that we provide for that policy. So the policy is in place at an institutional level. It's an enabling policy, but policy itself is not enough. You must support it with um, training and support and guidance to make it possible for colleagues to do work under that policy. The university policy says that it's that we want to encourage people to publish their materials as open educational resources, and that's not enough. You have to um, staff that and resource it. Um, with, with services. And the work that Lorna and her many student interns have done over the years um, is part of that enabling. So the policy makes it possible for us to have a service um, and to gain institutional support for funding and sustaining that service. So I would say that the policy is very important to us as a um, artifact that we can point to, to show that there is university commitment to this. And the, the policy is um, part of helping the university to deliver its mission in global reach and engagement and civic engagement and sustainability against the 
UN SDGs. So I'm happy to share the link to the policy for anybody who hasn't seen it, although I'm sure many of you have, um, and also to say more about the kinds of activities that it has enabled in the last year or so, the, um, the activity grows and continues. So I'll put some links into the chat and happy to talk more about that. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And also thanks to all the other participants who are already sharing links in the chat. I will take care of share them back after uh, the webinar is uh, ended with all the participants who enlisted. Uh, so uh, as far as uh, Antonio and Melissa shared with us, uh, it's a love relationship, even if with some uh, difficulties here and there. And uh, we, you, you've been talking about the development, promotion, uh, enabling others and mainstreaming. So those are already so very practical words that are and very practical verbs that accompany uh, open education policy development. I would love to hear also from Catherine and Mark. Is it a love or hate or a mixture relationship for you to see also from different perspectives and also again uh, with your practical experiences on top? Um, I'm happy to jump in, Mark. Um, I am unusual, and I would say it is love, and that is um, that just arises from a place of seeing how essential support of open education policy is. So, like Antonio um, and others here, I was an open educator for many years bec before I my attention was drawn to the importance of of policy, um, and as many open practitioners realize, and I certainly found in my PhD research, um, the lack of policy speaks very loudly. So a critical mass of open practice is impossible without um, a structural commitment to open expressed in strategy and policy and so on. So, and in fact, you know, I, I began my PhD in 2014 in the area of open educational practices. And one of the reasons for undertaking that PhD was because I wanted to be, you know, a, I wanted to have a stronger basis on which to advocate for, um, you know, strategic structural policy support uh, for open education. Um, I, and you know, so when I, I, I worked in the national forum and that was working kind of an, in a national collaborative way with librarians, um, open education practitioners and champions in various institutions, teaching and learning centers and students um, to identify priorities. And, you know, when I know we're talking about the UNESCO guidelines, but they're, you know, we, we just learned that they're wholly enmeshed. And, you know, Melissa talked about this at Edinburgh, you know, there's the OER policy and the OER service, you know, and they are, they are hand in hand with one another. And we found that in our research and in our discussions across Irish higher education, that um, you know we need to build um, open capabilities at, um, to to have a ground on which you know to build open education policy. We can't we can't um, create and try think about effectively implementing open education policy without that. They really go hand in hand. Um, so uh, I would one other thing I'll say just before maybe moving on is. Um, we learned particularly during the pandemic that it was really important to bring these conversations out of the open education silos um, because it, we, there's such a significant overlap between issues related you know, to digital and online education and open education. So things like sharing and privacy and datafication and so on. So we kind of wrestled our discussions about open education policy and open capabilities into broader audiences, you know, so that we could get all engaged. Um, in those discussions and really um, get the appreciation for open um, more more broad, you know, within the sector in Ireland anyway. Thank you, Catherine. And this reminds me once again that uh, we never, we have never, I mean, it, we need to keep in our minds that we always need to raise awareness because people might not be aware of open education uh, and uh, Involving people from other contexts, and uh, as you said, uh, don't stay in our silos, can be always 
helpful to have uh, other perspectives and uh, to keep in mind that we as practitioners are not alone at the same time, <laughs> which is always important. Mark, what about you? Seen from your perspective as a teacher, yeah, well, I've, so these last minutes, I've been trying uh, desperately to find any feelings inside of me which would be strong enough to be called either love or hate. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure I really have those feelings. I would say my relationship with with policy is fine. Uh, it's good. It's but we need some space in our relationship. I think that that's the one thing I appreciate maybe most. There's a few things I can say about. Uh, uh, um, about this actually in response to Catherine maybe uh, as well I, I came into this university five years ago and then uh, the board of the university made it actually quite clear that they were very um, they were not very positive about um, uh, any of these these kinds of, um, of ideas the reason was that the official policy of this university was that it is a campus university. It's very important that everybody comes to campus. This is where we teach that we are together, that we are there in person. Uh, I think it's a mistake. It, I think it's a mistake that to, to think that from that it follows that uh, uh, we shouldn't follow any of those policies. But still, we don't really have a lot of those policies. But things have changed rapidly in the last few years uh, because of, um, of COVID um uh, and moved in this uh, in this direction you can i think you can really see a movement uh, in that direction there now but what i have always appreciated about this year so people were skeptical but they left space now i'm so i so i have now this role as a as a teacher here in this in this uh, group i have to say so as a teacher i think for me, what's very important, what I expect from any policy is that it really gives me space in the sense that I believe that there's many, so many things which are unknown, so many things with which we still have to experiment, that it's that it, it, it seems to me crucial that any kind of policy you establish shouldn't be too <clears throat> fixed, right? So that we should still have this option of trying to find new ways, new roles. Uh, Antonio mentioned uh, podcasts as one thing he, he is doing. Well, five years ago, that would not have been the idea yet, right? And uh, uh, so it's it's good that you can experiment with these kinds of uh, new uh, media, etc. So things are developing so quickly, also on the ground, let's say, that um, this is something I expect, and it's actually something I get here. So, right, so people have their own ideas about what's good, what's not good, but I feel complete freedom to do whatever I uh, want to do, and that's something I very much appreciate. Thank you, Mark. And what you just said about uh, enlarging the space instead of uh, making it more narrow somehow, thanks to the policy, is a uh, Something that speaks to me very loudly because uh, we are always thinking about ways, uh, about uh, mm, ways to to make people more engaged, to to make them uh, happy to participate, happy to be part of a, um, a cultural change, which is what we are talking about. Sharing knowledge uh, is uh, something that uh, requires uh, an open mind and the possibility that I see in what you say to make mistakes and to to learn from them instead of exactly. being uh, uh, somehow confined. I think that policy making can be somehow vital for this. What do you think all of you about uh, the relationship between open policy making and uh, uh, a vital context that allows people to experiment and advance together? up to you to talk let's just open your microphone and go okay um can i say something sure okay. antonio first of all apologies for having jumped into the question of the love and hate before before that i was no too, worries i was too keen to share my ideas <clears throat> no, no i think uh, i think in the context of experimentation yeah I think uh, we need um, teaching and learning policies, initiatives. Um, we have at least um, something called curriculum redefined, 
which is a set of principles and threads um, for pedagogical reflection and uh, redefinition of uh, some of our parameters to make our, um, our learning and teaching uh, more in line with uh, the needs of our students. Um, I could talk about this for ages, but basically I wanted to say that for me, one important uh, opportunity that I have taken advantage of was to contribute to that initiative with a guide for uh, open education resources co-creation as part of learning and teaching uh, policy within the institution. Sometimes there are things happening in your institution that um, need some kind of intervention uh, and need an element of OER, open educational practice, um, even though the policy in particular may not be about open education resources or open education practice. So I think that's one important aspect of policy that we can debate later. You know, looking at other policies that have nothing to do with OER and how OER can contribute to them. Thank you, Antonio. What about the others? Melissa, what do you think about this? Well, I would agree that activity in OER should underpin other things in the institution. I don't know if all of those things are policy things. So for instance, the, the University of Edinburgh has a commitment to global reach and the OER supports that mission. Um, we have a commitment to sharing educational resources with schools all across Scotland to try to get university teaching resources from the <clears throat> from the university redistributed um, to teachers in schools so that they can take and use and reuse and adapt for their own um, teaching situation. So the commitment to doing that, it's actually the OER policy that underpins that. Um, so I suppose it will be difficult to do an OER policy at an institution that can't see the connection between OER and its other missions and values mm -hmm. policies. But I think policy isn't, isn't vision and values. Policy is around setting out some structure to enable the institution to put in place the support a policy that can't be enacted is no use to anyone. Um, so I think we have to be a bit careful as to what's policy, what's guidance, what's enthusiasm, what's mission, what's values. And policy, of course, yes, has to be signed off by governance groups within the institution. And that is often library committee or um, Senate education committee or whichever um, areas of the university deal with learning materials. I think that one of your questions about how do libraries play a um, role in this is, is very interesting because often libraries, their collections are consuming, well, libraries manage collections that they have um, brought in from publishers in various places outside the university, whereas open educational practice often is based on material that is developed within so it's homemade, um, born digital, uh, locally made, user made um, uh, materials within the university. And often librarians don't necessarily engage with those kinds of materials as much as the learning technologists and the media producers and the activity around distance education and MOOCs and such. So certainly in our university, the Although we work very closely with the copyright advisors in the library, in the library, they are helping us to understand whether there's third party rights included in the materials that our colleagues are producing. But the production of the materials is spread all across the institution in every teaching school in every area, not, not specifically um, in the in the library. Thank you for bringing uh, uh, libraries under the spotlight, Melissa. I have an example in mind uh, about something that you shared as a resource, just to ground the, the discussion on an example, maybe, 
and this out to milk a cow. Would you love to share something about that, Melissa? And then we can maybe ask our other guests to tell us something about the specific examples that show how somehow is also the third mission of the universities involved into open education and how we can rely on it, uh, even when an open education policy is not officially in place to start something, to start a project, to start sharing, because this might work also. Melissa, please. Well, yes, I mean, I think the important thing about OER is always to make it available in the smallest possible chunks so that people, so that the pedagogy isn't so often, if we share whole courses at OER level, then the pedagogy is all wrapped up in there and it makes it impossible for people to reuse in their own context. So we have a position which is to share things in the smallest possible chunk, unencumbered by how we were using it at Edinburgh. And yes, an example of that is the um, video on how to milk a cow, which I will pop into the, um, into the chat in a moment when I finish speaking. And this is from our veterinary school and it's about um, uh, bovine health. And um, it's, <laughs> it's a video that is quite a small snippet and we put it onto YouTube. I mean, the other thing about the University of Edinburgh um, policy is that we will put our materials wherever we think people might find it. Uh, we host it on our own platforms, but we will also put it um, where we think lots of people might find it. And the video on how to milk a cow healthily so that it doesn't get infected with mastitis is 75,000 downloads. It's just a very small video. And we can track, of course, um, who and all around the world is what kind of person is downloading that. And We've translated that um, little instructional video into a number of African languages deliberately to try to reach the parts of the world where we think it will be of most use. Um, and that, that has certainly made it accessible and reusable. Um, so the care that the developers in the University of Edinburgh, the care that they've taken to think about how it could be reused, yeah, Lorna has, has shared the link there, um, has meant that that little snippet of video, it's been downloaded. Um, as it happens uh, by, we happen to know that it's mostly men in the 18 to 35 age group um, in Nigeria and Ethiopia who have downloaded that. And that kind of data about our impact and the reach of that material is very useful to the university to, to think about how we make our global impact and make our OER useful. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, thank you for uh, sharing with us about these specific resource, which might be a small example, but it shows the power that uh, goes beyond the uh, boundaries. And also, uh, again, you, I mean, you are enabling people who are also outside of the university uh, context to, to do something in a better way. And also you highlighted the role of translations in this, which is key for us to progress because uh, in, this makes uh, resources much more inclusive and much more easily reusable for many people. And this is something that might be in a policy, but it might also not be in a policy. So sometimes uh, that's what I wanted to, to ask you about. Uh, we start from uh, small practices or small resources that are not. Uh, somehow um, relevant in other contexts maybe, but might be the key to show internally why an open education policy can be useful for the university and why there is also a recognition for the university's efforts there that might motivate uh, different uh, percep perceptions and different stakeholders. Do you have in other contexts, Mark, Antonio, and Katrin, examples like these? Yeah, well, um, I wanted to say that I, I'm, I'm in total agreement with uh, what uh, Melissa has said. In fact, I, I'm a great admirer of the work uh, they do at Edinburgh. Um, and in connection with, um, with what Catherine was saying about the silos, um, it is important that these policies that have been created so far in committees of people who are mm, very much under the 
under the banner, you know, they are professionally attached to the OER movement. It is very important that uh, these uh, new policies, the policies that are revamping the old policies, that start including other people. That's one of the things that I, I think we should do um, in Leeds and in other places. There are a lot of colleagues who are uh, not part of the OER movement. They don't associate themselves with uh, our community, but they are sharing OER because uh, as part of the research projects, they have to engage uh, public engagement with, um, with communities. Um, and these are typically considered spin-off activities resulting from research projects. But I, I do believe that they are you know, if they are shared with a Creative Commons license in an accessible way and they have educational value, these colleagues are contributing to OER. I think at the moment, they haven't been included in, in these discussions because they probably were not considering themselves as part of the open educational, you know, resources movement, open education movement. So um, we are going to um, ensure that uh, all this valuable work, all this strand of uh, open education through research um, projects and, and public engagement is included, uh, not only uh, in the policy, but actually in the, in the co-production of policies. Uh, there is a very important work, um, this is a good shout out for colleagues by At uh, Javiera, uh, Javiera Atenas, Leo Haveman, Jan Neumann and Christine Stefanelli, Open Education Policies Guidelines for Co-Creation, which I hugely recommend to everybody because uh, the question of policy, as Melissa was saying, is obviously about getting it through the right committees and enact the policy uh, because it's not good to have just a policy that is for, you know, for in case that you want to share, the policies have to be a bit more ambitious than that. Uh, but uh, in order for those policies to have the right legitimacy uh, and, and uh, engagement and substance as well, there has to be an element of strong element of leadership, but co-creation. Leadership from the institution wanting to achieve um, and go further and involvement of all sorts of colleagues and not just colleagues from the Open Education Resources Movement. Thank you, Antonio. I'd like to give uh, another example. Um, Lorna will start to blush. Um, an example of co-creation. And I think that one of the things that it's important within institutions when we talk about researching OER and innovating in OER is partly to think about how we in the institution reuse our own materials in different ways to do different things because the reuse isn't only um, outside the institution, or that might be just use a, a second time. But uh, one of the things that Lorna's team really did is to think about <laughs> pushing the boundaries of practice in reusing materials. And the links that I've put in, um, in here, are particularly uh, around the open textbook about the fundamentals of, of music theory, which actually was a MOOC that was created nearly 10 years ago. It was one of our early MOOCs uh, made available widely across the world. And then more recently, the materials within that MOOC have been adapted and updated and changed um, by Lorna and the course team, the faculty member, but also a group of students as well, thinking about how the materials from the MOOC can now be created into an open textbook and hosted on the university uh, open textbook publishing platform, which is hosted by the um, university library. So a group of students engaging with that material and thinking about how it can be um, used in different ways. And that effort has meant that the um, material that was that we get will get return on investment rather than just sort of retiring old material we're always uh, reusing it and um, thinking about how we can move it on to different platforms and many of you will have heard me talk about before the fact that the institution needs to be able to understand the licensing on its materials because we often 
often need to move material around from platform to platform, um, either because we're changing our platforms or because we actually have a bit of business that we need to do. So another thing that Lorna's team did during the pandemic was obviously to take a real about respiratory health and turn that into a MOOC on the Future Learn platform that was available online. Thanks, Melissa. Oh, did Melissa freeze there? Can I jump in? Um, sure, I think, yeah. mm. All right. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I, I don't know if I, I preempted Melissa, but I think she's frozen on my screen anyway. Um, I, I'm really finding value in this notion of narrating our practice because, you know, I'm familiar with a lot of Edinburgh's practice and Antonio's and Marx and so on, but this narrating the rationale behind it, I think is so valuable. So like what Melissa was saying about, um, you know, sharing the most granular um, forms of OER, um, it's important to be explicit about that. And then also to model that, which I think everybody here does. So, you know, in the national forum, for example, you know, we learned at the very start after consulting with librarians and teaching and learning professionals and students that people didn't want a big chunk of, you know, how to do open. They wanted small focused guides. So that's what we produce, you know, how to choose an open license, how to assign an open license, you know, and I know Edinburgh does that as well. And I know many people here do as well. So modeling all of these things that we're trying to encourage um, is is so important and then just narrating the practice so you know in that enabling policy guide we narrated and broke down what that descriptor enabling actually means when you put enabling in front of policies it means integrated with the HEI strategy reflective of the HEI culture that it's collaborative that it's student staff partnership that it's inclusive that it's intentionally equitable and so on so you know, I think this is so important that it's, it moves beyond good practice and kind of breaking down and helping people to, you know, to get a grasp on good practice um, in different ways. So just want to say that I appreciate that from everyone. Thank you, Catherine. Melissa, you are back if you, if you want to add something more. Um, thank you all. I would like to ask you if we can go back uh, to uh, the librarian's role a little. Uh, I would love to know, first of all, if in your experiences specifically, librarians were involved in the open education practices you are using and you are uh, supporting, and uh, if not, if you see a role for them. Antonio, you okay. are muted, so you are first. Okay, okay, yeah, no, I, I was going to say that, um, linking with what I said before about the amount of OER that are being produced and shared as part of a research projects, we have this traditional distinction in universities between um, vice chancellor for student education and um, or provost chancellor for student education, provost chancellor for research. And then there is a whole set of uh, governance committees and structures around these two areas. I think the importance of libraries here is that they are uh, uh, both catering for student education and for research. So they have a pivotal role in institutions uh, because as explained before, OER and open education is about both uh, research outputs and teaching outputs um so they 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 are uh, the enablers of of um, this transformation they should play a very important role not only because of the expertise around copyright they are organizers of knowledge uh, expertise about um everything to do with um, resources digital resources but because of their centrality within the institutions. Thank you, Antonio. And what about the others? Melissa already shared with us about these 
but maybe you can also add something more. Mark, Catherine, Melissa, feel free. This is Kathy. <clears throat> this is Laura of North 30 in the States. And if you haven't connected with your librarians, you definitely should. I'm a librarian at OSU. And I think that um, I'm sort of just very skillfully captured a lot of it. We're uh, connected. Your librarians are going to be connected with so many departments across campus. They are involved in both teaching and research. Um, and they're scholars in their, their own right. And uh, at our campus, we're, we're faculty level. And we are producing OER. Uh, for our own subject areas and for library and information science. And many of us are instructional designers, uh, in addition to subject matter experts in the fields that we liaise for. Uh, but one of the other things in our particular library, the, uh, as, as we refer to policy, the org chart is a little thinner. And so I can get to my dean in just one or two knots. Uh, and have access to, for instance, the, the, the huge grants that the provost is trying to um, give away. Uh, whereas in other colleges, the faculty have a, quite a few more layers to go to go through before they get to the dean. So if you can link arms somehow with your library, your librarians, uh, Anna Lee Perry in Arizona calls librarians matchmakers. And uh, so I think that that combination of expertise and access to administrative support um, and the policymakers can really help explode those silos, as, as Catherine was mentioning, and, and bring things together and get them moving. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you very much. And what about librarians involved in policymaking? Do you have any experience directly or indirectly about uh, librarians sitting at the table to draft the open education policy? Uh, I'll just make one small comment. I'm sure Melissa and others can add more, but uh, it's essential and I don't know how you do it otherwise. Um, certainly in the National Forum guide that we produced, there's input there from experience of the of a librarian at NUI Galway, John Cox, who shared experience of creating their open access policy and some of the pitfalls and kind of enabled us to learn from that experience. But I would, you know, it's the handholding and the collaboration across, I think, librarians and teaching staff and students and teaching and learning staff, you know, that's, we found that combination was what unlocked a lot because no, none of us can do it on our own. Um, so, but yes, I mean, the, the, the librarian involvement and I, and I thanked Chris who's here and Celine who was here um, because certainly in my work in the National Forum and beforehand, you know, th those are key colleagues. We, we can't do this work, as Kathy says, without um, our librarians. Thank you, Catherine. Um, Mark. Yeah, well, um, so the only thing I can say, I, I guess, is that um, what I see in our university, well, Monique is here, and it's clear that in our university, uh, it is the library which is taking the lead in practice. Um, uh, and Monique has, a, has an important role to play to play in that. Uh, and that seems to be right to me. I mean, I, I, I agree with everything with Cassie first and actually in particular Antonio said before about the centrality of the of the library. So if you believe, so for me, um, uh, all of this is part of of an ideal. I mean, I do this, I guess, because I'm an idealist. I believe in this, in the ideals which are uh, underneath this. I believe that the university as a whole uh, should have that ideal, should share that ideal. So it is something to work on for the for the the, the university as a whole. But the library as something which is central, as uh, Antonio said, uh, is definitely uh, could be the hub for many of these kinds of uh, activities. I mean, of course, they cannot work on the content of this, but yeah, I, I can. De I, I definitely see that, and I see how that works in practice. I'm I'm very happy that uh, the library is taking the lead in this. Thank you, Mark. So I would love now to uh, ask our participants if you have any questions for our guests and if you want to ask them something specifically related to uh, 
your work or, or what you can do to advance uh, uh, something that got stuck in the way while trying to uh, mm, create or uh, promote an open education policy or anything else that you can you are willing to ask to our guests here. Just open your microphone and go ahead. Meanwhile, I would love to thank all of you for sharing links and experiences in the chat. I will take care of uh, everything that has been shared so far and uh, till the end of the webinar and share it back with participants afterwards. Any question from the audience? Okay, this is Kathy. I do have a uh, boring question, but are, are you all having success getting people face to face to share opportunities or are you still doing it online? Because that's what we're trying to figure out what to do on our campus. I've returned back to face-to-face -face presentations, but people aren't necessarily coming and we, we have money to give away. Thank you, Kathy. Any answer from our guests to, to Kathy or from the audience also, why not? I actually have to say that uh, apart from face-to-face -face communication, which um, it's important, um, Let's remember that for some people, face-to-face -face communication may be a luxury because that we have students as well in programs who are, you know, abroad all over the world, and um, it's difficult to replicate face-to-face uh, -face interaction. But one thing connected to that is, is that I have found increasingly frustrating the fact that we don't allow within processes and systems in general uh, within institutions. Uh, time for face-to-face -face communication, whether it is uh, online or physical, uh, and that is creating a lot of problems. I, I find that written communication by email, form filling, um, reporting, it is mm, not sufficient. Mm? It's not sufficient um, in terms of efficiency and obviously in, in terms of the natural human contact that we need. Um, so I don't know if that response, uh, you know, is a response to your question, but I, I also wanted to to make sure that we, we included this, that for policy making, for interaction, for collegiality, we need to see each other's faces and talk yeah, and interact. Sorry, it's Nick Shepard here. I was just struggling to unmute. And then when I figured it out through settings, it kicked me out of the meeting and now I've lost all the chat. <laughs> the chat thread um but yeah Hi, i was Nick. just uh, i was excited to hear melissa speak as she knows i'm a huge advocate of the work that they're doing with wikimedia so um i think we, we are making progress at leeds um but i'm just really interested never having uh, heard you talk before melissa if you've got any um sort of advice on how to promote sort of the the work that you've done with wikimedia at, at edinburgh um, and i think you were at one time of leeds weren't you i think I was, and in fact, I first had Wikipedia explained to me by a university, uh, university librarian at the University of Leeds back in the day. Um, yes, our commitment with Wikipedia, Wikimedia, we have a Wikimedian in residence at the University of Edinburgh, and that is a big part of the digital skills of understanding how participating in the world of open knowledge is something that all of our staff and students and researchers should understand. It seems to me a key um, digital skill, digital literacy skill. And of course you learn about the licensing through your participation in, in that platform. Uh, Wikipedia, Wikimedia um, are the largest open educational platforms in the world um, and in multiple languages and on every topic. And to participate in the, creation and collection and curation and 
debate around that knowledge seems to me something that every university student, every academic, every researcher should understand what's going on behind, you know, that platform. The technology was supposed to transform and democratize access to knowledge. And yet what we see in that platform is so many of the structural inequalities that we see in all of society and in academic publishing in particular recreated on those platforms and unless we take an active role in that area then we risk seeing a lot of the structures around open educational knowledge shaped by other people perhaps in ways that we would not want as librarians and academics and members of higher education institutions so I Nick has my quote which is that I, I do not understand well yeah are you still surprised <laughs> and, 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 it, and it's, it you know it really is just Edinburgh and um, as you know um, and as Lorna and Antonio will know I've been banging on about it for ages and I think we are making some progress at, at Leeds but it is you know it is still an uphill struggle, I think, to get others engaged or resourced anyway. Yes. We have a question from the audience from Igor Lesko, uh, and uh, he asks, uh, is there a plan at your institutions to evaluate those policies? I find that uh, there is limited information available about impact of OER, OE policies at the institutional or governmental levels. By policies, I mean different policy instruments, regulations, funding, information. And Catherine, thank you for sharing already uh, some policy examples in the chat too. Any answer from, yeah, Antonio, please go ahead. You're muted. <laughs> I was typing the answer to Igor, but then I deleted it. I'm going to say, it. Um, I think it's all very well to evaluate policies, but to me, we don't need to evaluate our policy. What we need to do is to evaluate our ambition, yeah, institutionally, uh, our commitment to share more, to have objectives, doing so with international collaboration, because um, the policies that I know of are mainly policies that have been designed with the idea that, you know, sharing is something that people can do if they feel like but it's not something that institutions are committed to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't think assessing a policy under the old you know, paradigm of, you know, we may want to share is, is any good because the result is, is not gonna be valid for a new paradigm in which we have to say institutions are going to have a strong commitment to share with clear objectives and a drive towards it. Mm -hmm. So rather than evaluating the policies, redefining our priorities and then finding elements of the old policies and the new new policy elements for that, you know, more ambitious objective. Thank you, Antonio. I, I, I love this, Antonio. And I mean, I, I just think, you know, something I take from the whole discussion is let's uh, find and share that love for lack of a better word of policy because it's it is essential and you know i can share one example of someone in ireland who recognized that policy was so important and had to support institutional strategy and so worked even upstream from policy when there was a strategic uh, reformulation exercise going on at the institution to get open embedded in the institutional strategy knowing that then they could intentionally use that you know, to drive policy downstream. So we need to look very big picture and think structurally, um, you know, at all these levels, I think policy, strategy, um, um, guidelines and so on. So, but yeah, th just thanks to all here for all the work you are doing, because as you said, Antonio, this collaboration and sharing practices across in institutions and internationally is, it helps us all, so thanks. Thank you all. I think that uh, we are on top of the hour. So our time is gone very quickly, honestly. And thank you uh, to our open education champions for sharing your insights with us. And thank you all to all participants for your questions and all the resources that you share. Uh, 
we just need to continue discussing about uh, how to uh, implement action area two even better and how to support each other. And I'm grateful for this discussion also because we started from a uh, high level and then we dived into specific uh, experiences and then went back to talk about the, the relationship between uh, um, policies and uh, strategies, which is always uh, needed. Thanks again for being with us. And uh, I'm, I look forward for our next chance to talk together and uh, just keep in touch, okay? Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.